Hi everyone, welcome to another round table. Today the history and culture uh, cluster here at CNES has decided to discuss on the very pressing issue, which is the Israel and Palestine conflict, which at the moment has led to one of the biggest humanitarian crises seen by mankind. The conflict hasn't been something that has just struck out of past few years of conflict, but it has been generation and decades of conflict, decades of fighting for um, statehood by Palestine and the recognition of their state. So with the pressing issue, we thought it would be a great discussion for us to add more complex and nuanced conversation around it. So with that being said, um, a small housekeeping rule for the participants. If when you're when you decide to answer one of the questions and you would like to answer one of the questions, please just raise your hand and um, I will call you out. So with that being said, let's go to the first question. Um, are external actors such as neighboring countries or international organizations working towards perpetrating or resolving the conflict in Israel and Palestine? Savya, you would like to answer? You can go ahead. Uh, yeah, hi, thank you. So um, I would like to begin with the countries neighboring the Israel-Palestine region, such as Jordan, Egypt, and Eden. They have been historically involved in the conflict and have had varying degrees of influence on the region. Uh, Egypt particularly has played a significant role in the conflict, being one of the first countries to support the Palestinian Declaration of Independence and recognize Palestine in 1988. Uh, Egypt has also long since condemned the Israeli attacks, being a strong supporter of self-determination for the Palestinians. It has been involved in various peace initiatives and negotiations to help bring about a resolution between Israel and Palestine. One example could be the uh, Camp David Accords, which was signed in 1978 between Israel and Egypt, recognizing the legitimate rights of the Palestinian people. It was also involved in the Oslo Accords and the Arab Peace Initiative. Even during the 2023 Israel-Hamas war, Egypt provided significant humanitarian aid to the Palestinians through the Rafah border crossing. Uh, even Jordan, King Abdullah II, has urged the U.S. Secretary of State to push for a clear to push for a ceasefire in Gaza and bring an end to the humanitarian crisis in the in the Palestinian territory. He has clearly talked about the need for a two-state solution to the conflict and underlined Jordan's total rejection rejection of any forced displacement of Palestinians from Gaza and the occupied West Bank. So, despite countries playing a crucial role in mediating peace between the two regions and consistently working towards towards a cessation or a de-escalation of hostilities during these times of war, there have been countries which have been visibly turning a blind eye. For example, since the Hamas attacks in October and the start of Israel's retaliation on the Gaza Strip, the European Union member states have been split into three camps. So countries like the Czech Republic, Austria, Germany and Hungary stand in the pro-Israel camp, backing its military campaign. Uh, Germany, Netherlands, as well as the UK have continued to supply weapons to Israel despite their arms exports policies requiring them to stop such transfers because of the risk of violating the international humanitarian law. At the other end of the spectrum are governments that proclaim to stand on the side of peace. And while strongly condemning Hamas, they have been calling for a ceasefire and openly criticizing Israel for violating the humanitarian law. Uh, these countries are Belgium, Spain, and Ireland and France. The third middle camp is made up of those who are somewhere in between the first two groups, siding with Israel, but in less absolute terms in the first camp. But the fact of the matter is that there is no pro-Palestinian camp at the level of EU governments. None of them has hoisted Palestinian flags or condemned the Israeli occupation or its Gaza offensive. A lot of the countries in the middle camp have shown support for the UN resolution calling for a humanitarian ceasefire, but the Austrians and Czechs still voted against it. Because of this, the EU leader summit in December 23 failed to agree on any joint statement. And in January of 24, the European Parliament passed a resolution calling for a ceasefire, but, condoning, but conditioning it on dismantling Hamas. So in effect, it was legitimizing the continued Israeli offensive. And essentially, Europe has done more to encourage than to restrain Israelis offen Israel's offensive. Uh, the UN's, uh, UN Secretary General, on the other hand, has condemned the Hamas attacks. He expressed concerns for the civilians and urged that all diplomatic efforts to be made to avoid an escalation of violence. 
he called for the re release of Israeli hostages in Gaza and requested that Israel allow humanitarian aid access into the Gaza Strip in October. He has been advocating for a two-state solution and he's maintained that the denial of the right to statehood to Palestinians would indefinitely prolong the conflict. And a one-state solution with huge Palestinian populations inside that state without any res real sense of freedom or dignity would not be conceivable. Uh, ministers and speakers in the Security Council meeting in October discussed the need for a humanitarian ceasefire with an urgency to scale up the aid and the imperative to avoid further <clears throat> regional escalation. In a statement in this uh, same meeting, Venezuela said that the conflict is a result of Palestinian people being unable to find their space in international law, urging the UN to fulfill its role as the guarantor of international peace. But the UN has not uh, devised a comprehensive way to enforce international humanitarian law and has had a poor track record of success. One main re reason is that there is a history of the US blocking UN resolutions critical of Israel through its veto power. The U.S. has vetoed at least four UNSC resolutions condemning Israel's settlement on Palestinian land. Even in 2021, Biden publicly voiced support for a ceasefire, but he stuck with Washington's long-established policy of failing to acknowledge the, the level, the deeply asymmetric conflict between Israel and Palestine by expressing his support for Israel and its right to defend itself. Uh, so, like the U.S. has been accused of giving mixed signals to both Israelis and Palestinians. It does support a two-state solution where Israel and Palestine coexist as independent states, but it has failed to take a strong enough stance to promote that two-state solution. It has not been using its influence or weight in the in the international relations to stop Israeli settlements in the occupied Palestinian territories, but it has continuously used its power to put a constraint on Palestinians' diplomatic efforts to reach their own goals. So this is a major obstacle in any sort of conflict resolution, and it creates a situation where Israel faces few consequences in the sense that there is a lack of pressure and a failure to hold Israel to its commitments and legal obligations during the peace process. And simultaneously, Palestinians are facing a severe restricted ability to advocate for themselves. So this weakens the two-state solution that most countries are advocating for to resolve the conflict. Um, thank you, Sabia. I think it really summarizes the bigger issue of how um, economic ties also plays into how international relations and also um, protecting the Palestinian state or even protecting the two state um, method that is in that has been advocated by many states. And in fact, we see a lot of Middle Eastern countries being a little more supportive and being a lot more um, supportive in taking refugees because um, the area has also seen something very similar happen earlier as well as with Syria. So, you know, conditions um, of uh, ge ge geographical conditions also play a huge part in how um, state relations work. Um, thank you so much, Savya. So moving on to the next question, um, building on past peace efforts, such as the Oslo Accords or the Camp David Summit, what is the current diplomatic scenario in the Middle East? Is it working? And is it working? Would anyone like to answer it? Okay, so Nakshi, you can go ahead. Um, thank you so much for that question. Um, before I start answering, I think I just want to say that whenever I hear or see the word Middle East, it reminds me of something because last semester I had international relations and um, I wrote Middle East and my professor cut marks because from where we're sitting, it's not the Middle East, it's West Asia. So I think in the spirit of decolonization, I try to propagate it and I also try to include it in my vocabulary. It's really tough because it's a huge mental shift, but yeah, I'm going to try to use it in my narrative today or my answer today. So I'm going to try to tackle this answer in two ways. Um, first, I'm going to look at the diplomatic situation of the Middle East as a region, and then I'm going to zoom into Israel and Palestine. So if we look at diplomacy in West Asia, it has always been extremely volatile. It's not been very structured. Um, this is because of the autocracy that is present in the region. We have a lot of Islamophobia um, coming in from outside. We have a large number of refugees which are scattered all over the region because of which we don't really see a lot of structure in the region. We don't really see a lot of positive diplomacy moving around. And if you actually look or if you study the history of diplomacy of West Asia, you would see a common factor. And that is the influence of 
the white man right so i'm going to in a good example i'm going to use her to kind of illustrate this is israel and palestine because that is the overarching theme here so if you study israel's history or how it came into creation firstly the jews had to kind of go appeal to the brits to give them a state because at that time west asia was completely controlled by the british um and when the british agreed and did give them a state then we see and they kind of left the scene you have the un coming in with their partition plan and then after the un and um you have the us whose influence we can still see in israel and the relationship between israel and us is something which is very unique it's a relationship which we don't really see between any two states anywhere else in the world and it is a major factor in the israel and palestine war moving on uh, to a little bit about diplomacy between israel and palestine um i'm going to take the example of the oslo accords and the camp david summit just a point both uh, in both of these summits the us did have a very major role to play and both of them failed so the camp david summit did not um, could not create any kind of memorandum of understanding to start out with and if we go back to the oslo accords even though during its time it was seen as this document which was considered to be a breakthrough in the entire war and in the entire um conflict its implementation was not so good we don't really there were a lot of points of contentions which kind of came up after the accords and that is why both of these diplomatic tools can now be considered to be failures and i think the biggest example of how west asian diplomacy fails is the current israel palestine war along with that you also see the coming in of the houthi rebels um that is another very good example of how west asian diplomacy has not been able to rein in um the violence and it is such a volatile um, um such a volatile region now i think the way to kind of move ahead of this how do we untangle west asia from the conflict it's facing um i think the region needs a messiha it needs a leader and if we put this in perspective to our own continent which is asia we do see two states come come up and kind of advocate to be the leaders of the region which are india and uh, china so a very recent example is india is going into the un uh, human rights council and it is advocating on behalf of myanmar which is facing so many human right uh, human rights violations it is facing so much violence within its borders we do see india coming up and being that leader and fighting for its neighbor in the human rights council and advocating for steps to be taken to help the people of Myanmar we don't really see the same kind of leadership in the west asian region and i feel that if we do get one state which is able to step up and take that onus then i feel a lot of the conflicts in that neighborhood could be resolved and if we zoom in closer we can see that the state which is most capable of taking up this role is israel because it is the largest just military region a uh, military power in that region it does have a lot of diplomatic sway we also see that it is considered to be the startup state the country of the world so if israel is able to fulfill this kind of prophecy which it should have then i think a lot of the problems the west asia is facing will get resolved but if we look at why is israel not able to do so even though it is one of the leading economies even though it does have such a huge military why is it not able to fulfill this role <laughs> it's basically because it has a survival complex and that survival complex is something which is very unique to israel it's something which no state not even india for that matter faces and that can be so when you're studying international relations you should look at states as human beings and any student of psychology will tell you that every human has their own insecurities they have their own traumas um which kind of predict how they act so if you then look at israel as a human being then the trauma or the insecurity it faces is antisemitism especially the holocaust and that that kind of dictates a lot of israel's actions that dictates its survival complex so i think what we have to do to untangle or create structured diplomacy in west asia is to relieve israel of its trauma and this is really tough i don't i i don't think i have enough knowledge to sit in kind of act as a therapist to israel but i think uh, it will require some of the greatest minds in international relations to sit down and figure this out because it's the root of the problem it's the root of the west asian problem and i feel that if this is solved is if we as a generation are able to solve this it will liberate so many west asians from their suffering and it will take them forward and it will pr probably make them reach the heights of development and peace that they deserve as human beings so yeah that's my answer i hope i have been able to answer the question
Thank you so much, Sonakshi. I think the analogy you used um, talking about the trauma that Israel has, I think a lot of people are in general very confused. How could you inflict this on other people when your you know, forefathers have suffered in the insufferable, like Holocaust was the most documented genocide we have. I mean, I think after this might be the Palestinian issue. Um, I think that's very important and I think it draws very little light on this because a lot of people look at the, you know, the grave intensity of the act they're doing. Nobody is actually looking at what could be the reason. Um, so yeah, I think I that was a really nice answer. Um, so moving on to the third question, how big of a role do uh, factors such as religion and culture play in the conflict? And is there any effective way of addressing it in a peaceful manner? Okay, Tarana, you can go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, so firstly, I believe the Israel-Palestine conflict is a very complex issue with varying dimensions, be it religious, cultural, political, historical. But I believe religion and culture especially play a very significant role in the conflict. And that sh and addressing that as a part of any viable peace process is essential. So on the religious front, both Israelis and Palestinians have previously claimed historical and religious ties to the land based on the respective faiths of Judaism and Islam. Jerusalem itself uh, is the proposed capital of both a Jewish state and a Palestinian one. Uh, and it is holy to both uh, religions, housing important religious sites. Any final status agreement from either side will need to resolve issues of access, sovereignty, governance um, over these sites in a way that is acceptable to both sides as well, um, which I, I understand it's a very hard thing to come on to, but especially with Israel and Palestine, I feel like any solution uh, that we reach will be hard to come to, as previously mentioned with Sonakshi as well. So culturally, Palestinians and Israelis have lived uh, in the same land for decades, but uh, maintained largely separate national identities rooted in their distinct like his histories and narratives around the conflict. Decades of violence, mistrust and stereotyping, and even currently there's so much violence going on in that region. Um, and there's so much mistrust among the people. Uh, these kind of differences have further widened this gap and created a more psychological barrier between the two people. While uh, political negotiations focus on territorial and security issues, I feel like any peace deal will ultimately require like a more cultural shift towards greater acceptance and coexistence between Israelis and Palestinians. Efforts at like people to people reconcil uh, reconcil Oh my God, I'm so sorry. Efforts at people to people um, like harmony and joint initiatives and tolerance can help lay the foundation for such a shift. Um, and further, religion culture have further fueled the conflict for decades and will need to be a part of any lasting solution as well. However. Uh, addressing these issues will not be as easy given the deep religious and national sentiments involved on both sides, uh, as I previously like mentioned in my answer. And Israeli and Palestine, Palestinian leaders, in my belief, will need political courage and vision to make compromises that may be unpopular among some of their own constituents in the name of a more comprehensive peace with goodwill, openness, and willingness to overcome these historical grievances and trauma. Uh, Israelis and Palestinians may find like a basis for coexistence that uh, that respects both their religions, cultures, and national identities within the peace. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tarana. That was a really good answer, and I think you also sort of brought light into a little deeper of an issue where people in fact let's say people out of israel and palestine like israelis who are in the us or just in other places they are also i think i would say indirectly impacted in the sense of having to support their state in some sort of weird commodity which a lot of people you know have put, taken the courage to not do so but zionism which is a very extremist um way of looking at it but um, you know, there is a weird um, 
ex like a emphasis on kind of supporting your state or the motherland even though it might be at times politically and just you know on a human level disastrous um thank you so much that was a really good answer um moving on to the last question what is the two state solution what are the arguments for it and against it and is it flex uh, is it feasible in the current political context anyone would like to answer okay saranth you can go ahead. uh yeah so um, I'll start by explaining what uh, a two state solution actually means, although it's a very, very basic thing, uh, but it means like creation of two states, of course, different for Palestinians and different for uh, the Israeli Jew, uh, Jewish population. OK, and uh, to understand how this two state solution um, was supposed to work, at least um, once again, I'll just switch my Internet. Yeah. Yeah, so just to understand how this two-state uh, two solution was supposed to work, we need to look at uh, a little bit of history. So starting from um, the U. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so yeah, starting from the UN resolution of, uh, of partition in 1947, 56% uh, of the land was provided uh, to the Israeli Jewish people and the rest to the uh, Arab population. And back then, of course, uh, because pa like the Palestinian region was, uh, I mean, it, it uh, belonged to mostly the Palestinian people. So they, they found this sort of partition unjust uh, because also the, uh, we have to understand the politics involved in the uh, mandate of partition because this 56% of the land given to Israeli Jewish people was like the more fertile region. And uh, of course, um, uh, according to that sort of partition, Arabs were, you know, separated at two different corners. And so what happened is that the next year, uh, Israel um, announces itself as a, a state uh, or nation in itself. And then uh, that's when the next day, uh, four or five Arab countries uh, declare a war against Israel, which of course uh, Israel wins. And that's what we call Nakba. So, yeah. And then after the Nakba, uh, when like the uh, Palestinian population, the Arab population is, you know, just shifted to the Gaza Strip and uh, a lot of population moves to other countries and one uh, and a big chunk is in the West Bank, then they draw a green line. Uh, Israel draws a green line and that that's what uh, is considered as the basis for the two state theory. Um, that green line, of course, ran from the Gaza Strip and the West Bank and or everything in middle was supposed to be Israel. Okay, uh, in 1967, uh, Naksa happened again, a six day war in which um, Israel basically got control over even those parts like East Jerusalem, Gaza Strip and uh, the West Bank. And uh, the whole basis of the two state theory is to uh, is for people to say that uh, things should go back to the 1967 six days war that is before Naksa, like the way Gaza Strip and West Bank was um, you know, autonomous uh, part of Palestinian people. Um, and UN thus came with a resolution. It's called Resolution 242. It's like um, widely talked about. So it talked about how Israel should take back their armed forces from these regions, how, you know, uh, there should be se sovereignty of both these places, uh, individual sovereignty. Then, of course, boundaries based on Green Line and Jerusalem should be, you know, div uh, divided as a uh, common capital where like the Jewish neighborhood should go uh, like should be part of Israel and the Arab neighborhood should be part of uh, you know uh, Palestinian uh, state etc um, and yeah and there should be of course a corridor from between Israel to connect Gaza Strip and uh, West Bank so this sort of solutions have been talked about of course and then the, the closest that anyone as uh, mentioned by some of you the closest we came to that was the Oslo Accords um, I mean, initiative of US, uh, although we have to understand the politics of Oslo Accords, because like when uh, that sort of, uh, so Oslo Accords was like um, a sort of agreement that was tri uh, like tried between the, uh, tried between PLO, that is Palestinian uh, uh, Liberation Organization and, um, uh, and the P uh, and the state of Israel uh, represented by uh, PM Rabin there. Okay. Uh, but then understanding the politics of it involves that while the Oslo Accords was happening, uh, U.S. used to, uh, U.S. was still calling PLO as a terrorist organization. So uh, 
uh, while on one hand they, they do not, they continue to call them terrorists and they continue to not uh, acknowledge their right to freedom they were having this sort of accord so of course like uh, there was a half hearted effort which was mostly coming out of the fact that intifada was happening a few years ago and they needed to somehow uh, stop that sort of uh, revolt from the palestinian people uh, and of course because of uh, oslo accord was of course uh, a, a failure in the end because um, like none other uh, because because uh, unbelievably of course in two years in 1945 when uh, oslo accord um, was being discussed even more than the prime minister of israel that is rabin uh, he was assassinated by a right wing uh, J- jewish person um, so basically even in israel they were not of course on the same um, page about the oslo accords so uh, coming to the main points of course um, so when we are talking about the two state solution uh, the two state solution started um, after that started decrease like its popularity started decreasing so um, we we can see that in 2008 46% people were in support in 2010 58% people were in support of the two state uh, solution in israel and then it has reduced to 34% now in 2023 of course uh, with the whole um, uh, genocide going on and the basically a war going on etc uh so and a lot and two state solution uh, went down in popularity also because in both places uh, a very extremist right wing uh, sort of government came in place uh, hamas in gaza strip and uh, netanyahu in uh, israel and then uh, of course lack of political pressure from usa and a lot of other um, uh, other things like you know how israel continued to make uh, settlements in the west bank etc so now people are people started questioning the two state uh, solution so some of them uh, some of them believe that still maybe one state solution is the um, uh, is is the more viable one because you know in two state solution you have to kind of um, g- give a blind eye to the sort of um, uh, economic uh, the the enmeshed economy of the region because of course a lot of uh, palestinians reside in israel and the economy is all like uh, mixed up and all of that so if there was a two state solution then you would just have to do a very tragic partition but um, so a lot of people supported a binational one state where you know uh, two different nationalities reside within the same place so these sort of solutions have been tried in yugoslavia kosovo and a lot of other places and they have been like highly unsuccessful um so yeah and then of course uh, jewish people wouldn't want a one state solution because the whole idea of israel was that oh there should be a homeland for jewish people and if of course uh, 40% of palestinian people also join it then it wouldn't be just a homeland for them which is like connected to their emotional uh, uh, so sort of thing um and yeah and people who supported one state solution believe that if if you make it a democracy then jewish people can also you know sort sort of uh, come to sorry um, uh, arab people can also sort of you know compete and come to election and all of that uh, like come to power etc uh, but in the present scenario concluding in the in the present scenario it of course seems very uh, unlikely that something like a one state solution can be um, can be agreed upon because that would be just like you know asking jews to coexist uh, in germany even after the holocaust because of the genocide that's going on C- can't really expect uh, a one state solution uh, because of all the bitterness that will exist uh, among these communities and uh, i think i, I think uh, right now the question more uh, burning question is to start a, to like initiate a ceasefire and uh, stop the israeli aggression um and i really feel like uh, right now the question is not about which solution is more viable one state solution or two state solution the whole debate was about how to, how to reach a solution which is like less uh, you know you know less violent or or less disturbing or turbulent for these communities but with the ongoing war on genocide um, it, it it's no longer a question of which solution is safer to go with i think the two states i mean right now even if even if two state solu- even if the international community was to agree over a two state solution um given the way the israeli prime minister or the finance minister are talking about that uh, you know pal- palestinian people is a myth and the palestinian state is a myth and all of these things it's more about stopping the zionist um role towards you know genocide um and i i believe that they can of course at any day come to a solution but it's it's more about that they are now unwilling to come to it
Yes, um, thank you so much, Saranj, for your answer. Um, I think the root cause that what we can kind of conclude looking at the two state solution from the get go is that it tried to be diplomatic and very, you know, it tried to be diplomatic, but it's I think one thing we have to understand is when partition happens, it's never about diplomacy. It can never be diplomatic. It's something that is very crucial and it is a very it's one of the biggest things a state can undergo, which is partition. And due to the involvement of such big parties like the US, um, diplomacy is, you know, I would say a big keyword of the US, how they deal with a lot of issues and then, you know, things get out of hand and then they're not visible. Um, so I think that is kind of the big problem of it. And I do agree with you right now. It is um, it, it's almost unimaginable to look at it as a one state and I don't know how it's going to go forward. Neither none of us do. And that is kind of the question in hand now. Um, but with that being said, I think we have reached a very fruitful discussion. We have covered how culture, religion and how neighboring states and, you know, international relations have impacted this issue. And what were the get like, you know, the nuance issues that have been surrounded that has led to this current ongoing genocide. I think it was a very great discussion. It was great having you guys and um, to our viewers. Um, thank you so much for catching up with us and we'll see you at the next round table. Thank you.